Absolutely. I'd really appreciate it. You were resentful. Your character was resentful when the um, Brenda left and Sharon came. Have you? Do you feel that the resentment is completely gone now? It will never be completely gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, he, it's not resentment as much as. <clears throat> Provenza had never been in charge, didn't want to be in charge, had no desire to be in charge. Biding his time, getting through, you know, the, the days. And, and um, but then, uh, through seniority and circumstances, he ended up in charge <clears throat> for a short time. Well, a little bit of taste of that, <laughs> he, he enjoyed. But he also enjoyed, it gave him a certain amount of self-confidence that maybe he hadn't had before, that he could do this, and that he, even though it was a short time, he did a good job in that short time. And in fact, it wasn't just him that uh, didn't want Raider taking over, it was the whole squad. They liked him as, as the boss. Um, but the hierarchy had made a decision and uh, in the department and in the writer's room. And uh, so that decision was made. And then you play with that, you know, you, 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 you find ways to, uh, to play with that as an actor. And it's worked out great. I mean, uh, no, I don't resent her, the, the Raider really at all. Uh, uh, and, and I did it at the, at the time, again, it's what was written, you know, to, uh, it, yeah. And he, and he said, I deserve to be here. Right. Yeah, and uh, he felt it was taken away from him, but it, it was a it, it, it was a brief encounter with his fifteen minutes of fame, and it was more like six weeks, six minutes of fame. How would you describe his relationship with Sharon today? Oh, I think it's very, very good. One of great mutual respect. Uh, he admires her. Uh, she still aggravates him, but uh, most people aggravate him uh, on one level or the other. I mean, the center of my whole life are my two grandchildren and uh, and my children and, and, and my family in uh, general, but my two grandchildren. But I don't know of anybody who aggravates me more than they do. <laughs> but uh, I love them so completely. and um, so, so, sure, she has a character. Uh, she does things that that my character disagrees with or just aggravates me. But I uh, respect her and admire her and very fond of her. Very fond of her. Very protective of her now. You know what's interesting? I found very interesting that in your show that I haven't seen in other shows is you talk about the fact that you the police are willing to plead down a case just to get it like off the docks and to get that person in jail. And I know your character sometimes has problems with that. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Did you talk to anyone about how to play that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Um, my my problem was that we were my character's problem is that we were doing it at all. That we should be the least bit concerned with it. This should be a DA problem, not our problem. Uh, and yet this episode we're doing right now, I'm pleading with the ADA, the Assistant District Attorney, to find a way to make a deal for this young lady. And that's uh, uh, in the past, before, you know, before, uh, before I saw a little bit of the light, um, that there are there are times when justice is just better served if uh, just getting them off the street rather than spending a tremendous amount of money for not a 100% situation. Um, but there are still times that it aggravates Provenza as it does any cop. You know, they see, they see somebody that they think really deserves, you know, the full brunt of the law and the law then works its way, the, the, the system works, works its way to extract what it can from the person rather than the ideal of what it should. And, um, you know, cops are rough, tough folks, male and female, but they're, 
at, at the base of them, they're very altruistic people. They, they really think that people are good and, and they want to see the best in them. And that's the reason they just can't stand people that, that try to hurt other people or commit crimes against other people. It just drives them insane. <laughs> yeah. Do you think your character evolved? I mean, for example, with this one episode, I was shocked because yeah. I, 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 I watch it. I'm a fan. Right. And it was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm hearing well, this wrong. Well, there's also the element uh, when you see the, the full episode there is the element of the grandmother that he has, as, as uh, Captain Raider says that toward the end, which we just shot, uh, you know, who's using this trusting relationship mm -hmm. that you built, you or her? And um, he, there's no question that his judgment has been affected by, by the, this, this, this grandmother and her dedication to her granddaughter. And being a grandfather, I think that both as a character and as a as a person, I think I think I buy into it. And I understand it a little bit. Um, but uh, this this is you know this is that exception that we all we all encounter from time to time. Being a grandfather has that helped you with this role at all? No, because uh, I think like most grandfathers, I don't think of myself as a grandfather of what we. You know, we were raised. Grandfathers were in Heidi, you know, the old <laughs> the old mountaineer, or in Beauty and the Beast, you know, the old white-haired guy, which I am, of course. But all of those images of grandfathers, most of us who are grandfathers don't think of ourselves in that way. We think of ourselves as um, full of life. I I am full of life. I have a great time with my my kids and my grandkids. Um, they have trouble keeping up with me, to be quite, quite, quite honest. Of course, teenagers do in general. That teenagers like to sleep, mm -hmm. sleep and eat is pretty much their go on the computer. Yes, go on the computer, and uh, so uh, I, I the, the, if we being a grandfather, not so much as it's just being older. Whether I was a grandfather or not, uh, tomorrow is my seventieth birthday. Happy birthday! Thank you, thank you. And uh, it just, even if it doesn't give you certain wisdom, people think it does, and that's just as good as it really does. <laughs> because they, uh, they just somehow, if you're 70 or older, they just think you know more. And uh, even if you don't, you know, you know less, which you, as you know it, as you will someday find out as you get older, you find out, you know, you knew you know about a tenth of what you thought you knew. Do you think that your character is a role model because of the age? Oh, I, I tell you, one of my one of my proudest moments was uh, in an airport, and I had a TSA officer. I had just gone through security, and he pulled me aside, and I'm going, "Oh my gosh, I don't have time," and you know, I'm gonna. And uh, so he pulls me over, and he's he's older, quite a bit older, and. And he comes over and he shakes my hand. And he says, on behalf of all the old curmudgeons in the world, thank you. We think you represent us very well. <laughs> and I love that. <laughs> well, you know, on behalf of all the old guys. <laughs> the fact, and what he's talking about, of course, is that I'm still going, just like he is. I'm still working in my job, in my, in my character, but I'm also, as a person, I'm still working in my profession. But this character... Uh, you know, he could have retired a long time ago. You know, he could have retired at full full salary. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the fact that he still works and still wants to work and still and still good at it, uh, even if he is a bit of a curmudgeon occasionally, um, they they appreciate that uh, very much so. Yeah, because it's it's like you're showing that at a certain age you don't have to be out to pasture. That's right. Yeah, absolutely, you yeah. do not. Can you tell me what? influences you had for this particular role? Did you have any influences? Did you read any books, any police procedural books? No, or? I've done, I of course, I've played a lot of cops. Consequently, over the years, I've done accumulative amounts of, uh, I would say, a minimum amount of research, actual research, as opposed to experiences with friends of mine who are 
who are in law enforcement because I have a lot of friends in law enforcement and a lot of uh, several very close friends in law enforcement um, and at, at all different ranks and levels, everything from chiefs and deputy chiefs and uh, deputy um, down to, uh, you know, sergeants and, and patrolmen and in different cities and different parts of the country over the last 30 or 40 years. So you cannot be with those people and not learn from them. And particularly if you're very close to some of them, uh, I've ridden in a, <coughs> I've ridden in a lot of patrols and uh, a lot of you know on a lot of streets in different cities, and um, and so you just learn. You just say. Plus the fact I'm a, I'm a voracious reader of mysteries, so I have certain mystery writers that I read and detectives that I read, and we all like to think we learn, you know, because we. Uh, you know, the police will tell you the worst thing that ever happened to them in many ways, and lawyers will tell you the worst thing that ever happened to them is law and order. And uh, because, oh, well, it's, yeah. I'm, so I saw no law and order, it must be it must be so. <laughs> this is the way it's done. And they have to tell them, well, I'm afraid that's not exactly how it works. Um, so, yes, I've, have I been influenced by them? Yes. Am I influenced by a, a gentleman named... Craig DeFaro, Chief Deputy of Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Department in New Orleans. I'm tremendously influenced by him, uh, by his knowledge, uh, his personality, uh, and by he's, he's my friend. But he's one of the most knowledgeable urbanologists, and he, which he is, and he's a cop. And but he knows more about urban, what needs to be done in this country in terms of our urban situation than anybody I know. If I can just get him to write it down. So can you tell me, like, what mystery authors you like? Oh, well, I, I, I love Joe Nesbu, uh, the Norwegian writer. Um, I, I just read a wonderful uh, Irish writer named McKinty that I loved his books. Uh, and I love, uh, you know, uh, uh, domestic, um, here in L.A., the, the, our most famous... Conley? Uh, Michael yeah, Conley. Mar Michael Conley, who was an... LAPD crime reporter, mm -hmm. and uh, he knows a lot of LAPD guys because of that. Um, Conley and uh, um, um, uh, just just put out uh, Mississippi. What is it? Uh, uh, Greg Isles. Greg Isles, um, fan of his. Well, there are many. I mean, mm -hmm. I could go on and on. Uh, James down in um, Louisiana, wonderful, wonderful writer who wrote who writes Roby Show. Dave Robichaux is a detective, a Cajun alcoholic. Um, and so I have uh, all kinds of writers that I, I love. What about your, the Sunshine Kids? Can you tell me something about that? Well, sure. Uh, Sunshine Kids is a nonprofit organization. We're 32, 33 years old now. Founded by a, a woman named Rhoda Tomasco in Houston, Texas in 1980. 182, right in there. Um, it, what we do is provide group activities for kids uh, that are dealing with cancer uh, all over the United States and Canada. Uh, we will take groups, a group together, for example, our national events. We have national events, regional events, local events. Our national events, which is sort of the, uh, the back, backbone of what we do, um, we have coming up here in three weeks. We will have our California Fun Time Fantasy. We'll have 30 kids from all over the United States who will be here from about mm, eight different hospitals. And we will have a nurse representing, or a med medical rep, not necessarily a nurse, from each of those hospitals. We will pay all the expenses, do all the organizing, all everything, with our volunteers and with, and with those nurses. Um, they take their own time to do it. They, they are not compensated. Um, and we will put together a week, a week's activities, like they have never. They will experience, quote, L.A., Hollywood, whatever, whatever we call this monolith out here. They will experience it like no one else does, and stay in great hotels, eat great food, go to private events, and and, and the parks, of course, and the beach, and all the good stuff. One of our one of our major uh, supporters here is not only this show, uh, and the production company here. Uh, and the cast and crew, all of the, all of the people who work here are so amazingly supportive, both financially and in their volunteering and in their helping put things together. 
Um, but we also have LAPD, uh, which is a tremendous support group for us. And that came, that came by, of course, like everything does. This person's a friend of this person. And our consultant was LAPD. He's now writer-producer Mike Bircham. And uh, I asked him if he could help us put some, a little something together where we could get some kids in a police car or something. Next thing I know, we have, we have the biggest um, motorcade that the city does every year. We stop, they close down Hollywood Boulevard for our kids. We have about 40 to 50 black and white cars in a parade. I mean, just an, a, a car thing coming here under sirens. And, and then Chief Beck greets them when they arrive here from the hotel. Chief Beck, Chief uh, LAPD Chief. And Chief Moore uh, will greet them at the hotel, and that kind of support. Uh, it, it, that's it's what this city does all the time. I mean, this is an extraordinarily generous city, extraordinarily generous city, and it's not only in the big level. I mean, you know, the big the big shots, and they have their big high dollar dinners, and that's wonderful. Believe me, uh, but it's also you know this is cast and crew. These are blue collar people. These are working class people. And uh, they chip in their money, their time, their whatever they can do. They make sure those kids are greeted properly. And, and it's a special, special day in their lives. And uh, we do that, then we do it. We have three national offices. We have one in, uh, here in Los Angeles. Our home office is in Houston. And then one in Connecticut, in uh, Hartford. And then we have volunteer groups uh, and centers all over the United States. And we deal with about 75 different hospitals a year mm. um, and uh, anyway I've been doing it for a very very long time uh, about 28 29 years somewhere in there and um, and one of uh, one of our board members is a producer here Andy Andy Sachs uh, is a one of is on our national board of directors and um, anyway that's what that's what we do we have a paid staff of uh, 11 people and uh, we have an annual budget of around counting our in kinds goods and services that are donated around three and a half million uh, a little better than two and a half million in cash uh, that we or that we need just to do our our without growing and we we always intend to grow and um, and so, yeah, that's and I, I right now I serve as the executive director of the foundation I have for the past several years. Uh, eventually, that will <laughs> have to go by the way because, um, you know, when you have an organization that's dedicated, <clears throat> dedicated to kids that are everything from two years old to 18 years old, uh, you know, it's sometimes good to have an old sage giving his advice. Mm -hmm. But you need you need energy, you need life, you need new ideas, new experiences, new structures, new way to do things. So we're developing new leadership for the organization, and, uh, and we're doing well. We're we're very lucky. I we have a very loyal support group. Uh, our national sponsor is Berkshire Hathaway Realty uh, Home Services. It's called uh, a division of Berkshire Hathaway, and. Um, and uh, they are very supportive of us. So. Yeah, I noticed it on the um, the refrigerator in the yes. break room. <laughs> yes, in, in the major crimes break room. <laughs> yeah, every now and then you will see uh, you'll see a yellow uh, a yellow sunshine show show up somewhere. You'll see it here, just filming. You'll see it everywhere, <clears throat> the cast and crew. But when you see it on screen, of course, we're not allowed to. But every now and then, like we had a football game at some sports event, and lo and behold. All the, the, the background artists, they're up in the back holding a big banner. It says, Go Sunshine Kids or something. And, of course, that's our prop department puts, yeah. puts that up there. Nobody else knows what it means except our kids know when they see it and our sponsors know when they see it. So the so. viewers should look for it now. Oh, yeah. yeah it's like, where is Waldo? Where is uh, yes, the Sunshine yes. Kids? Yes, where is the Sunshine Kid going to pop up? Yeah. So, you, speaking of... Children, you're like a father figure to Rusty, and, and is does that go into real life as well with you and Graham? Yeah, it it, it really it really kind of does because we're both from the same part of the country, and Which we both. Is? Well, I'm from Texas; he's from Louisiana, but I'm from right on the Louisiana border, 
and he is in the, the, the heart of the Cajun country, which is uh, Thibodeau, Louisiana, Homa, Thibodeau, that area, about an hour and a half out of New Orleans. <coughs> I was born and raised about three hours out of New Orleans. And uh, New Orleans is really my, my second home, and uh, as it is his, it's, he considers it his home, and his family's there. And so because of that background, and, uh, and I actually met him several years ago when he was, uh, I met him, I think it was the night he got his, he bought his first car. He, he, he worked on the Jeff Foxworthy, uh, no, not Foxworthy, God, he'll kill me, uh, Billy Ingvall, Bill Ingvall show. Uh, Bill, Billy and I both did Jeff Foxworthy, but Bill Ingvall's a, a comic, great comic, had a, had a show. And uh, he had two children, and I always tease Graham about it. I say uh, there was Graham played the son, and Jennifer Lawrence played the daughter. Oh. I said, what the hell happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, jeez, Louise. Uh, but he was in good company. She was in good company. He's a good guy. He's a good actor. And he's, uh, uh, yeah, I, can't, no, I would love to, to take credit for mentoring him or or is anything like that, but he's way, way beyond my pay scale, and uh, uh, he's act. You know, he's he's a young man. He's not a uh, he's not a kid that he plays on this show. You know. Speaking of role models, you always wear that hat. Yeah. Do you, are you doing it to tell your viewers, hey, you know, sunscreen and yeah, because watch that's it. A, that's the reason I first wore it. It was strictly me personally. We were shooting. I think it was the second or third day of the first episode, or maybe it was, it was right, right, right of the closer, right in the very beginning, and we were out on location. And I take medicine, uh, as many of us do at all ages, medication that they don't want you in the sun. Mm -hmm. Plus the fact I don't like it. Some I find the sun very uncomfortable. I don't like standing in the sun, and so I'm standing out there. I'm sweating, and I asked wardrobe. Uh, we were on location. We weren't here. And here there would have been a lot of choices, but we were on location. That's the only hat they had on the truck was this hat that was too small. And it's the brim is just, it does barely covers me. But it, at least it kept the sun off my head. Mm -hmm. And so we got ready to shoot. I just used it while we were, you know, out there uh, rehearsing. And we got ready to shoot, and I took it off. And the director, I don't remember who it was. I don't know. But the director said, no, it looks, uh, why don't you wear it? I said, you don't think it looks completely asinine? And he said, no. I said, well, I love it. I'd be glad to keep it on. He said, we don't have anything else, and you can't walk up here in an umbrella. <laughs> so, but, you know, uh, you don't have to wear it forever, but just wear it while we're shooting this stuff out in the sun. Well, after that, I mean, if, I, if, I was in, if my character was in the sun and I didn't have that hat on, you cannot imagine the grief I would get. Yes. I would get a lot of grief yeah. from people, even from people who hate the hat. They would still give me grief <laughs> that true. I went out in the sun without it. So tell me what you want the viewers to get out of your character. What would you like them to? Well, I think like uh, no matter what people say or uh, what they claim, uh, I don't care what character it is, uh, ultimately we all want to be liked. And and when people don't like Provenza, people that he, you know, the characters, other people, he really is flummoxed by it. He really is. And it's not that he, he doesn't lose sleep over it, but he just doesn't understand because he doesn't see that he's a curmudgeon at all. He just gives his opinion or view of whatever it is and that's it. Doesn't like the morning, neither do I. The crew here, the, they, they say, I'm told that the assistant directors, as I arrive, if it's an early call, 6 a.m., they use the term, they get on the walkie-talkies. Whoever sees him first, they say, uh, I spotted him, and the question always, well, is he grumpy or grumpier? <laughs> because prior to 10 o'clock, I, I personally don't believe people should be required to communicate prior to 10 o'clock. I just don't. It's horrible, and but I have friends. They want the radios on, TVs on. They want noise blaring from the time they get up in the morning. My apartment, it's quiet as a library. <laughs> no noise. 
Um, but ultimately, you know, I think I think he wants people to, you know, I, I think he wants people to like him. And I think Provenza wants, uh, you know, we think of the audience as part of our show. We don't think of them as separate. We don't think of them as somebody we're performing for. We, we've been with them now so long that when I run into people at a, at a, at a airport or a restaurant or something, it's, 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 it's not like they're separate from us at all. They're, they're very much a part of, of what we do. I mean, because obviously if they're not there, we're not doing it. You know, they're, they're part of the chain of us all. And so, and do I want those people to, to like me? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. But I also want them to know I ain't changing. I mean, I am who I am, and that's it. I think they like you. <laughs> Good, I hope so. <laughs> I think they do. And it's interesting that you said that, because so many authors also say that they want the audience to be a part of the story, the, the reader, the viewers, to be a part of the story. So. Right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I was taught in the theater. Uh, uh, my, my teacher was a brilliant, brilliant man. And he tried to teach us the concept of when that curtain first uh, goes up, whether it's opening night or it's on the 85th or 150th performance, oh, number one, it must always be the illusion of the first time. It never has happened before. This is the first time this has ever happened. And you must invite the audience in. I sit through so many plays, including Broadway, where they're up there and I'm out here. Mm -hmm. And I just don't get a sense of them inviting me in and me being up there with them. Uh, that, that doesn't mean they have to, to uh, solicit or, or, or count or, you know, or anything. It just means... Let just there's a way to let us know. We're all, one way you let them know. You know what is a lost art is talking loud enough. <laughs> so that's one way to. I can't stand it if I'm sitting in the theater and I can't hear. Yeah. I just can't stand it. I hear you. Go train. Go learn because you're not inviting me in if I'm having to work like this to hear half of what you say. So. Uh, I, I, that's, I, I, that's what I was taught. James Duff had the same teacher I had, who was the creator of the show. And that's the way we were taught. You know, you, 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 you invite the audience in. You let them know, we want you here. We're glad you're here. Because if you, if you weren't part of this, there would, there would be no here here. There would be nothing. That's it. Well, listen, thank you so much. Oh, I thank so you. appreciate you giving your time. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. And you know how exciting this is? And I love her. Don't misunderstand me. This is one of the few interviews I got all the way through and you didn't ask me about Kira. <laughs> so that's exciting for me. <laughs> and I love Kira. Don't misunderstand me. But 90% of my time in the past has been spent. So it's so great to see you. We're so happy you're here. How is Kira? <laughs> <laughs> Kira's fine. Thank you.